going on? <laughs> I hope people, that's funny, I can't see you all, but um, welcome. Good afternoon, uh, everyone in arts and culture, Zoomlandia. Uh, my name is Asuka Hita, and I am the Director of Learning and Engagement at the Institute of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles, I-C-A-L-A. I'll be back. Okay. Asuka, how many people do you think might join? Um, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Very loud. Say again. How many people do you yeah. think might join? Uh, last I checked, about 75 people uh, registered for Zoom. So maybe 25? <laughs> we don't know. Yeah, who knows? How many people signed up uh, last minute. So back to the beginning. Okay. Now this is the problem. I have to try to fix something. Share screen, share computer help. Okay, let me do that. Share. Okay, good. Got you back on there. Now, I don't know why, but my screen shows you overlapping. When I share the screen, are you overlapping? Are you sharing the screen right now? No. Oh, sharing my screen Getting up there. What does it look like for you? To me, it looks like three heads at the top and not overlapping. Oh, great. Okay. That's curious because mine is overlapping and I don't know if that's a control, you know, a sort of certain control. Okay. So stop share. Okay. In three minutes, we're going to get on. Okay. So I'm still here. I think she's here. I think she just is. Oh. Okay. I'm just Protect doing things. Privacy. I'll be back. <laughs> she's just writing something with that pen. Yes, with my Wiley pen. <laughs> Can there be a signal if I have lipstick on my teeth? I don't know what it would be. <laughs> like. Oh, no, but everyone would see it. No, forget it. Scratch my head or something. Yeah. Hmm. I hope this works okay. Do 
You can't see my intro right now, right? Mm -mm. I can't. Okay. My computer in. Okay, it's four o'clock. Okay, I'm ready. Ready, Jamila? It's showtime. <laughs> there you go. Full eyes. Wait, clear hearts. <laughs> <laughs> Can everyone see this? <laughs> <I'm gone. laughs> I hope people, that's funny, I can't see you all, but um, welcome. Good afternoon, uh, everyone in arts and culture Zoomlandia. Uh, my name is Oscar Hita, and I am the Director of Learning and Engagement at the Institute of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles, I-C-A-L-A. -A. And we welcome you to the online program, Re Morton in LA. We really felt compelled to put this together because we didn't want to let a lockdown keep us from talking about artists, especially the phenomenal artist, Re Morton. She's so phenomenal that she's actually in two exhibitions in LA, a rare exhibition devoted to her currently at the ICALA titled The Plant That Heals May Also Poison. And she's also featuring the extraordinary show at the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles titled With Pleasure, Pattern and Decoration in American Art, 1972 to 1985, curated by our guest, Anna Katz of MOCA. So we are able to actually um, provide you with a quick tour of our show as it looks right now at the ICALA space with our interactive 3D capture, which you can find on our website. Uh, it's called Virtual ICALA. And with virtual reality technology, you may visit our space. And we'll do that before we begin all these presentations with each of the curators. Uh, my introduction is going to be very brief uh, because we'd like to keep this soon to about an hour. Um, so just a few housekeeping bits. All of you are muted. We actually can't see you. Um, it's not like a usual Zoom. And we'll take, we'll take your questions in the Q&A box, which is located uh, at the bottom menu of your screen. And then we'll look at the questions at the end of the presentations and answer them. Um, this event is being recorded and I am handling the PowerPoint presentation, so I hope all goes well. Uh, we're all learning the ropes to all of this new way forward in the digital sphere. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the show a bit and Jamila will elaborate more on the ICALA presentation. The Plant That Heals May Also Poison is the first major United States exhibition of the artist Reed Morton uh, and it's the first in nearly four decades. The exhibition features several rarely seen works, including a selection of installations, drawings, sculptures, and paintings, and archival materials which span a single decade of artistic production before Morton's untimely death in 1977. The exhibition was curated for the ICA Philadelphia by Kate Craxon, curator at the David Winton Bell Gallery at Brown University. 
And this is the final stop of its exhibition tour and the first time in a long time that the work of Ree Morton has been seen and certainly uh, not this much on the West Coast. And this was organized here by our own Jamila James, who is curator at ICALA. Anna Katz is curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, MOCA, where she is currently organizing the first West Coast survey of Swiss video artist Pipi Lotirist. With pleasure, Pattern and Decoration in American Art, 1972 to 1985, is the first full-scale scholarly survey of the Pattern and Decoration movement, and it will travel to the CCS Bard Hessel Museum of Art, Annandale on Hudson, New York. She has curated Give and Take, highlighting recent acquisitions in 2018, and Peter Shire, Naked in the Best Disguise in 2017. From 2015 to 2017, Katz was the Wendy Stark Curatorial Fellow at MOCA, and during this time, she organized the museum's public programs. Previously, a Joan Tisch Teaching Fellow at the Whitney Museum of American Art from 2008 to 2013, she holds a PhD from the Department of Art and Archaeology at Princeton University. And her doctoral dis dissertation is the first book-length study of sculptor Lee Bontecou's oeuvre during the most active period of her production, 1958 to 1971. So welcome our crack team. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is share my screen to show you what it looks like to see the museum. Um, sorry, let me get to it. Stand up, I don't. So if you get to our website, uh, you go to learning digital projects and here you'll find virtual ICALA. Now we have our current shows and we also have uh, previous seasons. So we're gonna start by looking at the current show. And it's a very easily um, navigable platform where you just sort of hovercraft through the show. <laughs> Through the space, and I'm going to take you through the Re Morton show as you as it exists right now, and uh, we'll sort of stop a little bit in the area where um, you can you see the works that they will be focusing on today in the presentation. Sorry, so with your mouse you can see you can actually zoom in quite close and read uh, Jamila's wall text and. These little dots here take you through the gallery and stop you sort of in front of the various works. So this is up all the time. You can visit it at any moment. Sometimes it takes a little second to sharpen, especially when it says your internet is unstable. <laughs> Here we go. Into the void. <laughs> There's a video on the right, but you can't really see it through this uh, VR version. So I'm getting to the room where the Celastic pieces are. Over to around here. Okay, here's a view of the installation where a lot of the work they'll be talking about in this presentation uh, is right now. Okay. So All right. Sharing this. I think I can, I can stop and I have to go into another presentation.
Bear with me, I'm getting there. Okay. Here we go. All right. All right. Okay. I, let's start. All right. Uh, hello, I'm, ja I'm Jamila James. I'm curator at the Institute of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today uh, to this program and to be joined by my esteemed colleague and friend, Anna Katz, curator at MOCA and curator of the incredible recent exhibition, With Pleasure, Pattern and Decoration in American Art, 1972 to 1985, which you'll hear more about in a short while. Next slide. Today's program looks at the work of, uh, previous slide, Oscar. <laughs> today's work looks at the, today's program looks at the work of Reed Morton, uh, the subject of the ICA's current exhibition, The Plant That Heals May Also Poison, which was organized by the ICA Philadelphia and Kate Craxon, who's currently the curator at the David Winton Bell Gallery at Brown University. The exhibition, as Oscar mentioned, is the first first retrospective of Reed Morton's work um, in an American institution in almost 40 years. Uh, the last was in 1980 at the New Museum and at the Renaissance Society in Chicago. And it's the first solo museum presentation of Morton's work in Los Angeles, which is very exciting. And we're very happy to have this exhibition. As Oscar mentioned, the show is viewable in a 360 capture on our website. And we hope, uh, hope fingers crossed, that at some point soon, we'll be able to welcome the visitors and viewers um, in the coming weeks to catch the tail end of the show, which has now been extended through July 19th. Next slide. Uh, in particular, Anna and I will discuss Re Morton's work after 1974, where she made uh, many of the works that she's perhaps best known for, using a material called Celastic, which is a plastic-infused fabric, which gave Morton an incredible amount of flexibility and technical ability to achieve the textures and the shapes that she wanted to incorporate in her work, such as banners, ribbons, flowers, and bows. Um, and these materials and these shapes and these references put her in close proximity but not quite to the pattern and decoration movement, uh, which began percol percolating shortly after this time. Next slide. Our exhibition at ICA focuses on the last six years of Morton's career before her death in 1977, um, which follows the completion of her graduate studies at the Tyler School of Art at Temple University in Philadelphia, where she spent considerable time working as an educator and as an artist um, at the Philadelphia College of Art, which is now the University of the Arts. It's at Philadelphia College where she meets Cynthia Carlson, a fellow teacher and artist who becomes a close friend of Morton's and becomes part of the pattern and decoration movement, which Morton is not part of. She's more closely associated with post-minimalism, which precedes P&D by a few years. Uh, the term post-minimal was coined in 1971 by the art historian Robert Pincus Witten and has more connection to the personal and the subjective than the later movement. Next slide, please. Morton's work predating 1974 is marked by an interest in the natural world and uses materials such as wood, clay, stones, and graphite. Morton began life as an artist taking drawing classes in the evenings at a museum in Jacksonville where she was living with her husband and her children, her three children, and drawing became a through line during this period to her more sculptural explorations such as wood drawing which you may have seen in the first room in our 360 capture, and the early environmental work uh, known as Souvenir Piece, which was presented at Artist Space in 1973, and is considered an early example of installation art. This work uh, that you're seeing on your screen, The Plant That Heals May Also Poison, is of course the title of the work in the exhibition, and it was produced in 1974, a, move, a moment of incredible activity in Morton's career. Uh, this work references texts on horticulture and Botanicals that Morton was reading in the summer of 1974, which also inspired a series of drawings called Weeds of the Northeast, which we have on view in our show. Uh, the plant that heals may also poison uh, references plants and weeds that have medicinal properties, but can also harm someone if taken in excess. This title is key to the many contradictions and ambiguities that have become a major part of under understanding Reed Morton's work. Her biography, her life as a housewife and mother of three who embarks on a career as an artist, her ambivalence about domesticity and feminine imagery, and her resistance to being categorized as a woman artist as opposed to simply 
and artist, which has for better or worse become the lens for discussing and analyzing her work, but also illustrates her willingness to occupy several positions simultaneously and without hierarchy. Next slide, please. There is a major turning point in Morton's work in 1974. It's at this point uh, that she's working at the Philadelphia College and is invited to participate in a women's faculty exhibition. According to her friend, um, Carlson, and Kate Craxon's wonderful catalog essay for the show, a male colleague of theirs said that women would be better off participating in bake sales than pursuing careers as artists. This work that you see on the left of your screen uh, was made in response to that and submitted for the faculty show. It's called Bake Sale. It's the first instance of Morton using the material Celastic, which was a plastic infused fabric that becomes malleable for 20 minutes when it's wet with acetone or another solvent. In her interview uh, with Lynn Blumenthal and Kate Horsfeld, which the ICA hosted on our website last week, uh, courtesy of Video Data Bank in Chicago, uh, Morton talks about her experimentations in search of a material that would articulate the immediacy of her ideas in faster time, and Celastic became that for her. Uh, Morton said, quote, I went through a transitional period using soft materials, anything I could think of to use, anything that just seemed to be direct. I'd never been interested in secondary sculptural process, casting, or well, even the two-dimensional processes such as printmaking. Those indirect secondary ways really slow me down. Any material that I could just deal with fast because I was working through a whole lot of ideas and didn't have time to be doing like six coats of paint and long tedious things, end quote. Morton used Celastic, the bows that are on the wall in Bake Sale, and the scalp banner at the top of the configuration, which is a platform where the artist displayed baked goods as a tongue-in-cheek reference to her colleagues' less than collegial remarks. Morton learned of Celastic from a set designer that she was friends with and was attracted to the quickness in which she could make her objects. She would continue to use Celastic extensively during this period, producing many wall-based sculptures, such as the plant that heals, and several others that are in our exhibition. And she would use these works and debut these works at the John Doyle Gallery in Chicago in December of 1974, when she was a teaching artist at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. Uh, there are images of these works on the right of the slide on your screen. Uh, she would also, in this exhibition at John Doyle, use decorative wallpaper, which was reproduced for this exhibition exhibition and stage of reiteration of the show. Uh, this decorative wallpaper was purchased from a hardware store and she would use it to stage her sculptures and drawings against in this show, uh, creating what Kate Craxon, the curator of the show, calls in her essay, a grounding for her rapidly evolving material and formal explorations. Next slide. Another pivotal work of Morton's using Celastic is Bozeman, Montana, which you see far straight ahead at 12 o'clock on the slide which was completed while the artist was in residence at the University of Montana in May 1974. So this work predates The Plant That Heals. They also poison. Uh, this is actually the first work the artist made using both Celastic and the light bulbs, which would show up a couple more times in different works, such as The Plant That Heals and Maternal Instincts, also made in this uh, period. And it's also one that incorporates glitter and the names of her friends and loved ones, which would be a motif that would carry throughout the work. Next slide, please. Bozeman is the first use of text and Celastic. Uh, Morton used the Celastic material to press over block letters to form the names and words that comprise the piece. She made it in this period of slowness while she was in residence at the University of Montana. She remarked that most of her time uh, during this, this period was spent fishing, going to the mountains or to a pool and drinking beer. These activities are named on these small glitter banners that you see in the piece, as well as the names of her students of the time. Bozeman use, Bozeman's use of glitter also connects this work to the works, the drawings Weeds of the Northeast, which use glitter and flocking, and also an earlier sculpture called Seesaw, which we have in our exhibition, which is a transitional piece between her postgraduate work and these later works where she's using Celastic as opposed to wood and graphite and more natural materials. Next slide, please. 
References to the domestic would continue to appear in Ree Morton's work at this time. Uh, the work to the right is in our show, courtesy of LACMA. It's called Many Have Run Away to Be Sure. Um, it was completed in 1974 and is a direct reference to her experience as a housewife. Uh, it features an oversized banner, that's the structure at the bottom, and these small delicate bows fashioned with the celastic, uh, as well as the regional pieces, which the artist made while she was a teaching artist at the University of California, San Diego in 1975. Next slide. The regional pieces combine the domestic and the theatrical in their evoking of her time in Southern California, um, first in San Diego and then later in Los Angeles when she was in residence at the Women's Building, uh, which was the Feminist Art and Education Center founded by Judy Chicago, Arlene Raven, and Sheila Laurent de Bretville in 1973. Next slide, please. These works, the regional pieces, use the diptych format to depict a sunset or a coastline, which are painted from postcards that Reed Morton collected while she was in San Diego, and fish that are local to California and to the Southern Californian region. The humor and the drama of this work, with these small fish being projected to large scale, and the use of these dramatic curtains made from celastic, as if the fish were actors on a stage, showcase the whimsy and the fun of an artist constantly experimenting and using imagery and references at will. Next slide, please. During Morton's time in California, she began working on the banners for Something in the Wind, which you see suspended in the, the image on your screen. Uh, she would stage this work later at the South Street Seaport in New York, uh, comprising over 100 flags. The banners pay homage to artists who were friends and loved ones and in her personal network, which continues the impulses uh, in Bozeman, Montana, which named her students, and also works that made direct reference to her children, such as Maternal Instincts, which is the work that's the half arc work at the far end of your screen, which named her children, Linda, Sally, and Scott. Next slide, please. Morton's use of Celastic allowed her to work at both a more delicate scale, such as the bows and many have run away to be sure, and at a larger scale, such as the apron structure that's at the bottom, which also houses the title of the work. Next slide. In this room, which is the final gallery of the ICA exhibition, it shows an artist uh, with a great deal of dexterity in her interests and the material applications. The works in these galleries were produced between 1974 and 1976, primarily between 1974 and 1975. So she was highly productive in this moment. And it also showcases the increasing fluidity with Celastic and her real mastery of this material. Um, this material is capable of not just retaining every fingerprint, every move and gesture that she made, but also long draping, uh, such as in the work, Let Us Celebrate Youth While Youth Lingers and Ideas Flow, which the artist began in 1975 while at UCSD. And it's the far, the image that's at the far right of your screen. Next slide, please. And for Kate, a corner piece um, that show, the artist showed in her exhibition at the Women's Building, which was called Five Columns and Jones Lines at the Women's Building, which at that point was in Chinatown, Los Angeles on Spring Street. Some of the gestures in this work would be found in what is considered her master work, Signs of Love, uh, which was recently on view at the Whitney, uh, which she produced in 1976 and was shown in the 1977 Whitney Biennial. Next slide, please. Here's a close-up of Let Us Celebrate While Youth Lingers and Ideas Flow, which is the last work in our exhibition at ICA, and it's a nice gesture. Uh, next slide, please. And this is an overview of this whole run of works made between 75 and 76. Next slide, please. And then this is kind of the segue point where we can start talking about um, Morton's proximity to PD, her time in Southern California, some of the work that she was doing, parallel to some of that of her peers, such as Cynthia Carlson and some other artists that Anna will talk about. Uh, this slide has um, images of her studio in San Diego. You can see a lot of work in progress, which is always a joy to see as a curator, um, going to a studio where there's not much work in progress. <laughs> but <laughs> Morton was someone who was always making work, always very active. Um, the top right, um, the top left, rather, she has the bow paintings that she's working on, and also some of the banners and the flowers that would find their way into various works, such as for Kate and the works at the Women's Building. Uh, the image that's on 
The top right is Coil Piece, which has these little teeny tiny bows. It's in Oka's collection. Uh, it's a really beautiful piece, and it sets up what would be the work Devil Chaser, uh, which is on the bottom right-hand side, which is in the collection at, at the Art Institute in Chicago, which incorporates text in this really bold dimensional way, but also these really tiny delicate bows and these coils, um, in addition to an initial staging of Poor Kate, which is in the corner, which was shown at um, in the faculty show at UCSD. And then again, her studio with a couple of different works in progress, including Let Us Celebrate in its first iteration with these um, fabric curtains, which were later remade um, as celastic curtains to be more consistent with how she was working at the time. Next slide, please. Here is an image of Reed Morton at the Women's Building installing her exhibition. Um, Something that Anne and I both noticed in talking about this presentation is the decoration on the columns and how um, really fun those decorations are and kind of like another extension of the sculptural vocabulary that she was working by using the, ex the existing architecture in this way. Next slide, please. This is for Kate, um, which was a piece that was named after her grandmother, but um, also has other references. Um, there's a book that she uh, contributed to contemporaneously to making this work um, called Individuals about the kind of the post-minimal mo um, moment. And there's a text that she writes and she talks a little bit more extensively about this piece. Also, some of these pieces, um, the ribbons, the flowers, you'll see these repeated in uh, Signs of Love, which unfortunately could not travel uh, because it was in the making craft show at the Whitney. Uh, next slide. So these are examples of some of the small bows that we included in our exhibition at ICA. Uh, each bow has its own personality. They're no more than, they're pretty small. They're almost like handheld um, where the artist is really experimenting with the painting and the color and the kind of the twisting of the material to make these bows that would sometimes figure into other works um, and also stand alone. Next slide, please. You can see where they're installed in our galleries on the north wall. Next slide. And next slide. And I think here is a good point to turn it over to you, Anna, so we can talk about um, Morton's presence in your exhibition and the connections between her and some of the artists that are part of the pattern and decoration movement. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I think this is a good place to um, talk about how I see Ree Morton relating to um, pattern and decoration and the bow or the bows um, are, are a real key point for me or an important node in, the, um, in that map. And part of it I think about, um, you know, Jamila, you're talking about the sort of ambivalence or the way that Ree Morton's work kind of stages the field of possibilities that she as, as she assessed it, that were available to artists who were women, who were um, negotiating the traps into which they might fall or um, those which they might want to avoid or those which they might want to like obviate or those which they might be willing to accept, particularly when it comes to stereotype and gendered imagery and cliche. And part of the reason that I'm interested in the bows is something that really happens only in my mind, but um, Art historians in the group, um, I don't, we, we don't know who's here, but um, art <laughs> um, we'll probably be familiar with an essay by Lucy Lepard, an art historian from, uh, and the essay, sorry, is from, I think, 1973. It's called Household Images in Art. And she says that many women artists are shedding their shackles, they're untying the apron strings. And then she says, and in some cases, they're keeping the apron on and they're flaunting it and they're turning it into art. And so that is part of um, like the metaphor in which I see the bows um, engaging, that they're, um, that they're playing in some way with the apron strings and that Celastic, which Jamila, you've already identified as a like, key discovery for her, allowed her um, to put that immediacy and, um, uh, and directness, as you say, but also touch, it's almost hard to, um, overstate how much 
personal reference, um, narrative, autobiography was considered verboten in the mainstream art world for what it's worth and how much of a risk it was for an artist to put her um, biography or to put her touch, to yeah. put herself uh, into her her work at this time. And of course, this elastic also allows, as Jamila said, like theatricality and kitsch. And um, it really takes color. It takes like vulgar colors, candy colors, commercial colors, and it takes, um, yeah, a kind of gesture. So um, as Jamila's already said, and Jamila, I hope you'll interrupt me, of course, um, like, <laughs> There's, a, there's this kind of debate about directions in feminist art or an art by women or an art of the 70s that Ree Morton's work is seen to encapsulate. Though I tend, now that I have worked on a show of pattern and decoration, to actually see the work um, as more sincere um, and, mm -hmm. and less ironic. That's, that's the place yeah, that, um, that I got to. So maybe Asuka, we can look at the next slide. This image is of Ree Morton in her studio in San Diego. And behind her, you can see um, some of these bow paintings. And the spelling here is a witty little pun. B-E-A-U-X is how you would spell fine, as in fine art, or like beautiful art um, in French. But it also, of course, sounds like bow, like B-O-W. Um, and for me, my reading of the work is really deeply influenced by my reading of decoration and by the place of feminism in the development of the pattern and decoration movement. So the pattern and decoration movement developed in Los Angeles and New York and centers in between in the early and mid 1970s. And in a word, it saw artists embracing decoration, ornament and craft, all forms of art that had long been deemed inferior to high or fine art. They were embracing um, patterns that were drawn from the decorative arts, arabesques and florals and patchwork patterns. Their work was explicitly referencing Japanese kimonos and um, Turkish carpets and um, the tiled domes of Islamic mosques and um, African textiles. African textiles and a number of, um, yeah, a number of textile traditions and a number of um, traditions that would be associated with women's work in the home. So quilting and knitting and crocheting and decoupage and Valentine's making and scrapbook making um, and interior decoration. And what they were um, challenging was not only the sort of local uh, preference um, in the history of art for minimalism um, and for a spare, reduced and bare kind of aesthetic, but something um, uh, even greater in scope, which is that hierarchy of fine arts above decorative arts, which had prevailed in the Western art tradition um, since the early modern period. And since the 18th century, um, the decorative has been associated with the feminine and with the domestic, um, when that hierarchy between um, high art or fine art and decorative art was drawn along uh, gender lines in the 18th century. So, um, Patterning decoration artists, and I would argue Ree Morton in her way, um, were analyzing the bias against the decorative and determining that the decorative had been deemed inferior uh, in large part because of its associations with femininity and with domestic handicrafts. And they were at the same time um, working like really closely with art historians like Lyndon Nochlin um, and Lucy Lepard, who I mentioned, they were taking note of the near total exclusion of women from art history and um, concluding that it wasn't that women hadn't made art low these thousands of years, but that the art that they made wasn't considered art, that it wasn't um, validated as art. And so they set out to validate the creative achievements of women working in the home. And for me, this is a long way of getting Ree Morton. Um, here she is in San Diego, um, so charming um, and so young. Um, 
for me, understanding Reem Morton in Southern California sort of helps me draw a line um, between her work and the feminist art program, which had been founded at CalArts by Miriam Shapiro and Judy Chicago in 1971, and which culminated in this really important installation called Woman House in 1972. And it could be said, developed into the Woman's Building, which was this nonprofit, um, school and workshop and community center and theater and bookstore and restaurant in which, as Jamila has already said, um, Morton had a show in 1975 while she was uh, a visiting faculty down in San Diego during that year. Uh, and so I link her work um, to those feminist efforts. So when Jamila um, pointed to the work called For Kate that was made um, was it made in LA or made in San Diego, Jamila? It was made in Southern California. It was started in, in yeah, it was made, started in San Diego. Okay. Because it, like, it was shown in the UCSD yeah. show. Yeah. Yeah. And Kate, it was her grandmother, right? Yeah. I, I don't know if she's paying homage here to her grandmother's like craft traditions. I don't know if her grandmother had craft traditions, but all the same, nevertheless, um, I would connect that to um, a history of women in that moment recognizing a cultural inheritance and wanting to legitimate um, a cultural inheritance that they could claim yeah, along matrilineal lines. So those are some of the ways in which I read the work um, quite sincerely um, and um, with less ambivalence maybe than I would have before I worked um, on this exhibition. Oscar, can we go to the next slide? Oh, and then the next one. This is uh, an installation view of the exhibition with pleasure that is um, currently installed, but um, sitting in the dark uh, at MOCA. And then the piece and the right on the plinth is one of four pieces by Ree Morton in the show. And it's called rocker with one of the bow paintings. You'll see as we um, thumb through these slides that there are um, four works which all use this title, one of the bow paintings. And I think this must have been, are all the works in that previous slide of Ree Morton in her studio, those are all called one of the bow paintings. So I think that she must yeah. have been having a good laugh there because if you ask like, which one is it? The answer is always, it's one of the bow paintings. It's a little, I don't know. I, I, I think it must have been a, a, a who's on first, um, yeah, kind of moment for her. <laughs> so um, I'll show you, um, or Oscar will help us see more of those as we go on, but the piece um, on the riser and the right there, is called Rocker with one of the bow paintings. And then that big wall behind it is an installation by Cynthia Carlson. She came on site during our installation to make it. I'll explain it a little bit more. And then through the arch doorway, you can see a cloth painting by Kim McConnell, who Ree Morton knew in San Diego. They were both um, visiting faculty in 1975. And I just emailed him the other day to ask if he had visited her studio during this time. And he said yes, and um, that, he was, uh, that he was already making connections at the time um, between what she was doing and, and what he was doing. Oscar, can we go to the next slide? So here you see that same uh, rocker with one of the bow paintings from 1975, and then more or a little bit of a different view of this wallpaper installation by Cynthia Carlson. She made it by, well, first we at MOCA painted the wall in that gradient, that maroon to pink, and then eventually it becomes green. And then she came on site and she painted out those green frames. So those green frames you're seeing are just flat paint but then the pictures in them are paper, they're objects that are tacked directly to the wall. And then all those floral motifs that you see are objects. They're thin um, and pretty flat, but they're objects that uh, Cynthia Carlson made um, by piping acrylic paint through a cake pastry piping bag. This is something she started doing in 1975. She started making wallpaper installations at 100 Acres Gallery in New York by filling a pastry pipe, it's hard to say, pastry piping bag 
um, with acrylic paint. She was mixing it with marble dust and um, some other kind of acrylic medium, I think. Um, and then squeezing out these floral forms and then they harden and dry and she tacked them to the wall in these regular intervo intervals and then draws in in blue um, some shadows to give it the sense not only of dimension but even of a kind of like movement or, or jitteriness. I can't tell if that's coming across um, in this image but I can assure you that um, in person they have a bit of a vibrational sort of jumpy kind of um, hoppy hyped up quality and this was of course meant to be a kind of simulation of wallpaper a uh, um, decorative art and a domestic one that's normally seen as a periphery um, or a, a peripheral object something at the margins which Cynthia Carlson wanted to make um, the subject of her art and to insist on home as the location of art and then the third artist whose work you see in this room is Barbara Zucker, and that's that pink fan. It's called Blushing Bride from 1977. And Cynthia and Barbara and Ree were all friends in Philadelphia. They were all in that, um, they were all in the faculty at the Philadelphia College when Ree Morton made her bake sale piece. Um, Jamila showed us, uh, pointed out some of those flags that um, Morton showed at the South Street Seaport, there are Cynthia and Barbara flags uh, to honor their presence in her life. Um, and this blushing bride, it consists of a steel pipe that Barbara Zucker bent, and then she adorned it with this fan, with this ruffle, and coated the whole thing in pink flocking, and it rests against the wall. So her um, her position was to take something that's normally considered hard, again, it's a steel pipe, hard and phallic and male and cold, uh, and to make it soft and um, feminine and round and bent. She's very much um, uh, sort of like making a mockery here um, of a, a well of minimalism really, or of a kind of male chauvinism. She said that she thought of those ruffles um, as like the collar that a court jester might wear. And she was thinking about the way in which like a harlequin or a court jester um, is enabled to tell truth to power, right? Like the harlequin or the court jester can tell the king to his face that he's a fool um, or whatever it is. So she's sort of like exposing um, the I don't know, like the fallacies of what is serious by making this um, steel pipe <laughs> droop clean. Uh, next slide, Oscar. And now here you see um, more of the bow paintings there in the background. So these paintings, um, and they're they're uh, enamel on wood panels. These are like two by two feet with celastic. Um, applied to the surface. Here too we can say that the artist in keeping with pattern and decoration methods is taking something that would normally be considered peripheral, normally just like a little adornment, a bow, um, and making it the subject. And this work is, um, has been discussed in terms of portraiture. She suggested that they might even be portraits um, of bow. So she's um, endowing them with a kind of attention and um, focus, if not necessarily seriousness, but um, a kind, she's giving them a kind of merit um, that they might not otherwise be seen uh, to have. So um, it was important to me for this show and I think it's something you see um, throughout the show at ICALA, um, to see that motif, the bow, um, and all of its kind of like wobbly handmadeness, its tenderness, its nostalgia, to see it come into space, to see it come into space um, by having it land on the rocker. And this is certainly one of the like weirdest objects one could imagine. I mean, it's like the bottom of a rocking chair with a flat painting resting on top of it 
well, not a totally flat planing, it has elastic, but a, 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 a hard painting resting on top of it. And then it's festooned a bit with these like garlands of elastic. It's, it's certainly a strange um, and hybrid object, but I was interested to see the way in which um, Reed Morton sort of has the bow kind of like take on a life of its own, like come, come into space and be, um, animated in that way. And I was also interested to see her do that on this support, which is um, something again, domestic, like, yeah, like a rocking chair. Um, I was interested in this. Um, in part, and there's another one too. There's another rocker. Oh, yes. There's a bow chair. Also the bow chair in the National like Gallery. Little, yes. Oh, and that's a little yeah. baby that's yeah. a little baby chair. And that was actually given for what it's worth to the National Gallery by Barbara Zucker and Cynthia Carlson and their dealer, um, Pam Adler. Um, and offline I'll tell you, Jamila, why that loan didn't work out. But um ah. <laughs> That's, that's curator baseball talk. Okay, but so I was interested to see like the painting come off the wall um, in part because one of the things I think that these artists are doing in this period, Reem Morton and P&D artists, is pointing to the ways in which decoration, a bow, ornament, um, is not loyal to any one medium or material or scale in which it is um, like disobedient or, um, unspecialized in the way in which these motifs um, are not like the modernist painting which and you have to be a little glib to talk about it this you know briefly but not like the modernist painting that is medium specific and that is only about itself and that is purely about form and essence but that they're interested um, in these decorative elements that like slip and slide from like a ribbon in your hair to um, a bow on a present or a motif on printed fabric or a painting on the wall and that this sort of non-specialized power is actually, I think, the specialized power of decoration for these artists. The fact that it does have this kind of agency and it like slips and slides on and off of surfaces is I think what they like about patterns and what they like about decoration. Modernism was supposed to be about like essence and about stripping away everything that was considered um, inessential to the medium. And they recognized, first of all, um, that this meant that there was no room for narrative, for personal content, for biography, for gender, and for race. And so they couldn't really like have any truck with that. They realized that modernism was an art of exclusion and mm -hmm. that they wanted to make an art um, of inclusion. That modernism didn't like decoration because decoration goes on the surface. So in theory, you could take it away, but that's what they liked, I think. What I think, like what I see in these bows is that, that Ree Morton likes that decoration is superficial, that it's on the surface because she can have it move around. And this can be um, the, the kind of virtue of, of decoration. And, um, Okay, so there's that. And then maybe I'll just say like one or two other things um, about why I was interested to see Reed Morton in this context and why I was interested in the bow paintings um, in particular. Um, it has to do with interior decoration um, and with the home. Can we um, advance Oscar? I think it's gonna be several slides um, until we get to Kim McConnell. It's the second to last slide, the penultimate slide. Yeah, to this slide here. As I said, Kim McConnell and Ree Morton knew each other um, in San Diego in 1975 when Ree Morton was visiting faculty there. And this, in this um, installation view, we're seeing a lamp and a table, a couch, a painting, and two um, puffed paper pieces, vase decoration and lotus flower decoration, all by Kim McConnell. And um, the relationship that I would want to make here and the point that I would want to make here, and this applies to the Cynthia Carlson wallpaper too, and to lots of artists in P&D, is, um, well, these artists, again, are interested in seeing the decorative motif outside like a specific medium. So with Kim McConnell, we see the squiggle on the lamp and the squiggle on the couch and we see the wall decoration sort of jumping into space and um, there's the liveliness um, of the patterns that almost seem to again be like jumping off the wall 
in that painting that's in the center um, on the far wall in this view. And what these artists were arguing, um, how do I say this? Okay. There was a dream of the avant-garde in the early 20th century of the avant-garde avant -garde movements like um, the Steil in the Netherlands or the Bauhaus in Germany or Art Nouveau in France or even arts and crafts in England earlier. There, there was this dream, this avant-garde goal, um, which was to integrate art and life. The avant-garde dream was to spread abstraction um, into the realm of everyday life. And what P&D artists are arguing, and I would say Reem Morton supports this argument, even if it wasn't necessarily like her intention, but when P&D artists are arguing is that those people working in the home to decorate the home, usually women, though not always, had in fact already achieved the goal um, of the avant-garde of the 20th century, that they had in fact already achieved the goal of propelling abstraction into three dimensions, of making um, a total design. And p and artists correlated the art of like filling, arranging, and beautifying the spaces of museums and galleries with decoration um, and with the home. Can we go back one slide, Oscar? Just previous one slide. Again? Yes, no, no, that's good. That's good, just like that. Um, the last thing that I would say, and I know we have another slide that we were gonna look at together, Jamila, but before opening it back up to you or to our Q&A here, the last thing I would say, just sort of like a final thought about um, P&D and about what it meant for these artists to like shake themselves of centuries of bias against the decorative um, and sort of why that happened in this period. Um, you know, I think that they, well, I know, um, that they felt, as many did, um, that those in power were not serving um, the interests of the greater good. That, um, like, the, all those fictions of like, rational art and non-emotional art and reason had been exposed by the war in Vietnam, by Watergate, and of course, like by the hard work of um, the women's rights movement and civil rights movement, black power movement, gay liberation, and so forth. They understood that like a small class of people, they were white men, more or less, that like, gerrymandered the definition of art around the accomplishments of all those who like were not white and male, and that, um, anything that didn't fit the definition was dismissed. It was too kitschy, too crafty, too feminine, too vulgar, too fussy, whatever. Um, and that these artists uh, were like emboldened. And again, I see Ree Morton as part of this. Um, to like let go of that value system, to um, decide that like what it takes is a change in mindset. And um, that when they were, that these value systems were like arbitrary, not random, but arbitrary. And that when they embrace new values for what counts as art, craft and kitsch and decoration and ornament, um, that they were also like embracing new values for who counts as an artist by extension. Definitely. I mean, I was reading, you know, the critical reception of some of these artists in their time and also Ree Morton of her time, there is just this kind of not knowing what to do with this work. Um, Hilton Kramer remarked about Ree Morton's work in the 77 Biennial as looking like high school prom decorations, which is just <laughs> the lousiest it's thing. Only a anyone... bad thing because we know yeah. that we meant that <laughs> in a totally pejorative way. But totally, it totally. Have to be, you know, like it doesn't have to be. Linda Benglis, right, is like, I loved my dance uniform when I was a kid. I loved my baton. Like, why should I um, repress what is natural in? Well, natural is the wrong word. What is like irresistible in almost all of us, which is to love glitter. Like most of us are magpies. Like most of us actually do like color. Like most of us actually um, don't love gray slabs. Yeah. They're okay. They, they, they serve a purpose, but yeah. so do bows and ribbons and wallpaper. Yes. All right. Um, this might be a good time to take some questions, Oscar, in our last couple of minutes. I see there's a couple of questions in the Q&A box. 
Yeah, there are. Can you, <laughs> wow. Uh, do you want to start uh, in order of? Let's start in order of hardness. No, not hardness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, were her references to domesticity all ironic, since it seems she bristled against that word, or did she also have a warm, authentic place for the domestic life of a mother? Jamila, why don't you take um, one? I think I've sort yeah. of how I feel about that, I think. Yeah, I don't think it was ironic at all. I think it was deeply sincere with Morton. I mean, her children were, she did not see the role of artist or mother or partner as separate. They were all kind of in the mix together and everything that she did creatively made reference to those people that were in her circle, primarily her children, her family, and also the experience experience of the, the domestic, the being, a, you know, living at the home, working at the home, being a parent, trying to, you know, enter into the arts, so on and so forth. So I don't see her positionality being that of, you know, irony necessarily. I mean, there is some tongue in cheekness and some deep humor, of course. And I think like a critical eye at the experience of being, you know, in the home, you know, experiencing these things. But I think she was also approaching it, you know, from, a position of looking at the ways in which women and women artists are marginalized and how you know their experiences and the references that they might make in their work might not be thought of as important or serious. Um, seriousness is something that I thought a lot about uh, with her work and also in context of uh, pattern and decoration and other movements that kind of have this like vibrancy to it that might be seen as a response directly to the legacy of minimalism or other you know things that were kind of held up as the pinnacle of creative form but i think she was really really serious about you know her experiences and really foregrounding the personal and the sentimental in her work um, when there was a risk of doing so and when it wasn't popular or in vogue to do so jamila do you think it's possible that um, for Ree Morton, domesticity and fam and motherhood weren't um, like irreducible to each other. That like there was a version of domesticity that she was working with or that she was interested in in her art that didn't have to do necessarily with her like maternity. And I guess I'm just thinking about for Cynthia Carlson for this wallpaper installation that we see um, on this screenshot here. You know, she says she was interested in home as a place for safety and closeness and security and loved things. And that's much more nostalgic. It has less to do with like the structure of family life or the structure of trying to be a working mother. I'm, oh, all mothers are working mothers, but the, the structure of like the distribution of labor and more um a sort of romantic notion or sensual notion of home i think it goes in and out i mean something that's important about morton's biography is that she does move a lot yeah um and is in different cities you know working you know she was trying to establish a permanent home uh, for her and her children i um, in colorado she'd been offered a teaching position at you know towards the end of her life and there was always that interest in bringing the personal to the foreground but also like making kind of going back and forth like this elliptical relationship with domesticity that sometimes may have been you know positive but also i think always just kind of thinking about it critically but not being afraid to embrace it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we may need to move to another question we have some rolling in sure Monica Maioli, can you just, well, this is Curator Baseball. Can you describe some of the challenges in drawing the work together and traveling the exhibition? Her work is hard to see, and there are numerous installation works that are rarely seen. Can you tell us about some of the missing major but lesser visible works? Thank you so much for the exhibition. Sure. Uh, the show that we have at ICA, it's the third stop. Uh, it originated in Philadelphia, went to the Tang. Uh, at Skidmore College and then came to Los Angeles and, and given the length of the exhibition it's been on the road for almost two years now there is you know kind of the the issue of loans having to be pulled from the show not everything can travel there is the fragility question also with a lot of this work uh, given the age of it and also the rarity of it so for Los Angeles you know, knowing that a couple of works couldn't travel because they were being presented in other exhibitions, 
we were able to add additional works that were really critical um, to the understanding of the work, like Seesaw, which was not in earlier presentations, which was a sculpture made in 74 that has the wood plank um, trunk motif, but also uses the glitter and these little tablets that are on the floor. So, I mean, all of it is to in the service of understanding Morton's practice overall, which was, you know, less than a decade of work. So making the connections were quite easy. Um, I think including a work like Seesaw in the show definitely does connect the early work that is of a very different vocabulary to the later work and that it's bringing together these two different sensibilities that were in tension with each other um, in the interest of moving the show forward and looking at all the different inventive ways that Morton was exploring materials. So you kind of have to go like both chronologically, but also looking at the formal explorations that the artist is doing at the time and make the connections that way. Aren't there also, Jamila, like real conservation uh, challenges with this work? I mean, my understanding, for example, of the piece in Mocha's collection is that the Scholastic gets like, quite brittle yeah. and that it's very hard to clean and that as a surface, it's an attractant to dust and fibers um, yeah, and things around it. So I guess I'll, I don't know, I, I don't think it's telling tales out of school. I sort of said earlier, I'll tell Jamila offline why we didn't have <laughs> from the National Gallery, but I'll tell whoever is the, the invisible people um, who are listening now, which is that um, for reasons that I um, am totally sympathetic to, there was a requirement that the work be covered with a plexiglass bonnet. And that wasn't something that we wanted for this show. I was afraid it was going to look like a Victorian child had died or, you know, or something um, <laughs> like that. But um, in, in terms of conservation, showing the work exposes it to a lot of risk. Like it's, it's not uh, so resilient. That, that's my observation, my experience. Yeah. But I didn't have the um, challenge and pleasure of putting together a Re Morton show, so. It is all, it, it is a scholastic. I mean, it's an unusual material. I don't really know of any other artists that have used it. And, you know, there's always, you know, museums want to send a courier. We had a courier from outside the country that came with a piece that had some conservation concerns um, with how it was assembled. You know, artists sometimes use materials that are not, they're not thinking about the future of the object once it's, you know, out of their hands and there, you know, were some concerns about how one of the pieces was assembled because it was super provisional and how it was done, not, you know, necessarily something that would exist for 40 years <laughs> down the line. Uh, so there's a lot of care because there is only, I think there's a very finite amount of objects that Morton made in her lifetime. So, you know, things like the dim lights in the galleries that yeah. you may have noticed at the ICA show, that was to help preserve the works on paper. You know, the glitter, glitter is not the most stable material. <laughs> Um, and also like water, but not watercolor, uh, colored pencil and things like mm -hmm. that, that need that extra protection uh, so they can be with us maybe another 40 years down the line when someone hopefully stages another Morton exhibition, but hopefully won't be that long into the future. Okay, so um, we're, we're sort of at the hour, um, but I, you know, I'm happy to continue on. I, we booked the Zoom for a little while longer so we can continue to answer questions. I'm not I've never done this where I see you can type the answer, but if you'd like to take a couple more questions, we can do that. I'm, uh, happy, to, I'm happy to take a couple more. I mean, I have nowhere to go. It's, um, there's a national lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here. Uh, maybe the question from Rebecca Madelon. Rebecca also, Madelon. Who's Hi, Rebecca. a dear friend of both of ours. Hello. <laughs> Read it aloud. How do we ethically and responsibly as curators deal with artists of this period who chafed at their works associations with feminism, but who so clearly mined and were influenced by and objects coded as female or feminine, maternal and domestic life? Asking for a friend. <laughs> Anna, you want to start? Well, one great way thing to do is do a group show because then you don't really have to. <laughs> uh, one curatorial strategy is a group show because then you can really look at uh, a historical phenomenon as its own uh, beast and not as uh, motivated by the uh, intentions or desires of, uh, of individuals. Rebecca, that's such a good and hard question. And, um, I don't think I have an, 
I don't think I have an answer. I mean, I've shown you how I tried to do it um, in this show here, but damn, Jamila, what do you got? I, I think language is really important. I mean, your catalog is so phenomenal for this show and approaches these questions and kind of the ethos of this group of artists from multiple angles, which I think is always the most useful and productive way of thinking about art history and its continued production is to have as many voices at the table as possible. The group show format is also very helpful in that regard. You know, I mean, there's certain things and Kate Craxon um, touches on this in her beautiful catalog about reception and the framing of these artists and how, you know, she's also a feminist curator thinking about not privileging one way or another um, in talking about the work, but recognizing and not shunning the fact that, you know, being a mother was something that was very, that was central to Reed Morton and it's central to elements of her work. And there's no point in trying to pretend as if it's not. Um, or also the fact that there was this tension between not wanting to be identified as a woman artist and not necessarily ascribing to feminism of that moment, but having having an ambivalence about that and recognizing that ambivalence is a perfectly fine position to occupy. Mm -hmm. I think there's also a place in Kate's essay um, in the catalog where she says that she realized that if she were to like deny Re Morton's motherhood, for example, um, that she would find herself like replicating the very sexist conditions that made it difficult for Re Morton to navigate her career. Not necessarily her totally. work, in her career. And um, damn, I don't know, Rebecca, I feel like you have to try to um, update your own feminism, you know, from the 70s. But like Jamila, I think is saying, like, give real credence to the conditions. Um, and the circumstances in which those artists found themselves, again, maybe separate from like the making the work, but like trying to have a career to the extent that they did. If and I think as much as we can, we foreground the work. We talk about the work. Yeah. Everything else is peripheral. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. <laughs> that's the ticket. Yeah, that's it. how you do it. <laughs> well done. Bravo, Jamila. Okay. We did it. <laughs> Let's see. Um, oh, thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, how do you feel that these attitudes of challenge to the value system, how do you feel that these attitudes of challenge to the value system have or have not survived in the current climate of multi millions of dollars being paid for art? That's a good question. I think the, the question, maybe this person can, um, respond back, but I think the question is, um, is it possible to, to challenge like the hegemonic value system and <laughs> um, have the art circulate in an economy that can only be identified like with, with capital and, and with patriarchy and um, shit, I don't know. Uh, how do I feel that these attitudes of challenge the value system have or have not survived? Well, I think that the attitudes of pattern and decoration of those artists have survived. Um, I think they survived without a lot of people noticing for a long time um, or without a lot of people noticing that those value systems could be identified or the challenge to those value systems could be really closely identified with pattern uh, and decoration and the pattern decoration could be understood as a um, important moment in the history of um, challenging these value systems. There is on the one hand, um, like a widespread embrace of decoration, craft and ornament in contemporary art. And I always say oh, as yeah. a routine example that like the meteoric rise of ceramics in recent years um, is testament to this, you know, among um, many other tendencies we see towards um, like a heterogeneous imagery. I mean, I always say, I don't know, um, and I say this like fully respectfully that this view of the exhibition to me looks like a Laura Owens painting like just the whole, like this particular view um, that we're looking at here. There are many ways um, in which I think um, decoration, again, as a, like a jab to that value system 
um, or the embrace of decoration, the embrace of ornament, the embrace of craft, like the real embrace of like Matisse in young painters today, that all of these um, are examples of the longevity and the influence of pattern decoration that um, hadn't been really fully assessed until recently. How it lives that... on. Oh, yeah. sorry. No, no, no. It lives on in, and it lives on in like the legacy building of artists that are coming after this moment. I mean, Anna mentioned the explosion of ceramics. You know, I was living in New York at the time where everyone who was a painter was making some ceramics on the side <laughs> and it became, you know, a thing. And, you know, so many younger artists are looking to this work art and artists of all generations are looking to pattern decoration movement, Ree Morton's work. Uh, you can see and like the artists at reference all of these different artists as influences. Um, and also, you know, the institutional attention to these works as of late. I mean, Anna's show, uh, the Whitney's Making Craft show. Um, I was in France last summer and there was a, like a show that was like this international look at pattern and decoration and also support Safas. So there is this life that will continue in these objects and in this inquiry that runs counter to the market in the interest of the market, but you know, it's all symbiotic. I mean, I can, I can tell the person who asked this question that the market value of most of the works in my show is uh, p pales in comparison to, um, I don't know, blue chip and uh, auction house, auction house stars. But, um, but I understand that the question is um, also about what it means to pose a challenge to authority in, in the art world such as ours to the extent that it's informed by the art market. And that's a, um, that's a question you have to face with a different affect every day. Oof. I think the fun that we have as curators, Sorry, I, think the fun that, I, th I think the fun that we have as curators is doing this kind of excavating of these histories that don't oh, yeah. get brought <laughs> to the surface as much, you know? It's, that's the fun it's of it, and that's the work, the important work that needs to be done. It's the dream. It is the dream. There are two more questions we can tackle. Okay. Uh, Julia Hafkandel. I'm- Hi, Julia. I'm interested in the- Hey, Julia. She's, she's interested in the humor in Morton's work and how it uh, is definitely not irony, but just funny. Did she ever talk about humor in her work? Great talk and great shows. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think there is this kind of sharpness and this funniness that's a through line in the work. Um, I would say the use of text in her sculptures is definitely a key in that direction, um, like the works Terminal Clusters or many of Run Away to Be Sure. Um, you know, these kind of pithy funny short phrases that escape interpretation have a sharpness to them. I think her humor and her funniness is really in the handling of the materials. I mean, like I mentioned earlier, the fish on a stage, like with the proscenium and the draping. I mean, it's funny imagery, even though it was extremely earnest and serious and sincere. So I think it goes back and forth. There is like the material, the visual, the formal funniness of some of the, the choices and also some of the, the, the references that she's making, I think is where the humor really comes to the forefront. And also I should mention like the weeds of the Northeast drawings I didn't really talk about much. Those are from a, a Victorian era book called Wildflower, Wildflowers Worth Knowing. And there's other drawings that are in this kind of this period um, where she gives these human characteristics to plants and it's a really funny way of updating this kind of buttoned up uh, conservative material with um, a real deep sense of humor giving plants a life like a funny human humanistic life that's funny and it's in its formation I think she does I mean I'm trying to think uh, I'm scanning in my mind the catalog where there are um, reprints of notebook sketches. And I think there are some yeah. references to humor yeah, in her notes. And I remember um, that she makes a list of things she loves and things she hates. And one of the sketches from the late 60s that's in the catalog, and she says she hates elegance, good taste, and color relationships. So, okay, she definitely had a sense <laughs> of humor. And, um, and, and I would just, um, Julia, just 
I mean, I would love I would love to be able to hear you, Julia. This is such an um, interesting format. Um, and it's hard to explain humor because it kills it. Um, but um, <laughs> like Jamila says, there's a lot of like wit and wordplay. And as I said, even the title of these works, one of the bow paintings and bow is a pun to begin with. And they're all called one of the bow paintings. But in, so in some of the works, I think there's like, yeah, wordplay and visual puns and that kind of humor. But I think that in the uh, work that's in, um, in With Pleasure, it's a humor of like exaggeration. Um, of taking this, um, taking something again that is small and like a little bow um, and making it sort of like absurdly oversized, absurdly yep. colorful. Um, Jamil used the word personality, I think, to talk about some of the work. And it, it kind of has this like goofy stance, you know, like if it were a person, it would be like a real like goofy, um, you know, type. And that there, so there is a kind of a like, um, I don't know, like a burlesque or something. Like there is something, there's an over the topness or I guess, I guess again, just to go with it, like an exaggeration um, that, that I see as being the sort um, of, of humor uh, in this work. Yeah. And, and that also gets a little bit to like that question of seriousness. Um, you know, there's seriousness in work and there's also importance. I think for me, yeah. for a lot of work in pattern and decoration, like, the work is not about serious things, but that doesn't mean it's not about important things. I think that's a good place to end. Okay. All right. Yeah, we could, people are excited. There are a couple of questions, but I think we can archive them and you know have, have you look at them later, but thank you so much. It was great to hear about Kim Connell uh, in the last part because we had done as the Santa Monica Museum of that's Art. Great perspective on Kim McConnell in 93. Yes. Michael Duncan, so it's nice to hear it all come around. Uh, the catalogs are available. You can purchase the show's uh, catalogs, Ree Morton, and um, there you go. <laughs> I think I have one. The, the, the big important catalog of the whole the whole show and follow all of us. Uh, we're, we're staying active on the digital platforms until we can see you in person again. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so fun. much. Thank thanks you, you Anna. Thanks, Jamila. Take Thank care, you. everyone. Everybody. And thanks everyone for joining us. Yeah, Take thank care. You for joining Be us. Safe. Thank you for your questions. Bye. Bye. Hello.